All right, let's go to scripture this morning. We're going to go to John chapter 6. Um, and this is in the middle of Jesus' message about uh, bread. And uh, so I'm not going to read all the verses because it's, it's a chapter that's 71 uh, verses long. And so I don't want to read 71 verses. So I'm, I'm going to pick some highlights and then uh, you can read it when you get home. Let's go to John chapter 6, verse 35. It says this, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus doubles down in verse 51 and it says, I am the living bread uh, that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I will give him uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. And then he closes uh, in his last few uh, statements here in this message on bread. It says this, when many of the disciples heard, uh, heard it, this statement, this message, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to, his, said to them, do you take offense at this? Even in Jesus' day, people be offended. Uh, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending um, to where he was before? Like, like if you saw me go to heaven, would you believe it then? Uh, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the very beginning who's, who those were who do not believe uh, and who it was who would betray him. He's talking about Judas. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Meaning the Father always draws us to Jesus. Um, it says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus to the 12 says, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I'd love to title this message if you're a note taker, which if you're a disciple, you should be. Um, is this, I got two titles. I know you're not supposed to do that but I was in two minds. The first one is more than meets the eye. And if you want extra credit, now filled but not full. Filled but not full. Let's pray and then we'll move on. Heavenly Father, I pray you're with us for the next 35 minutes. You speak to our hearts. You help shape our, our soul. You help us follow you. God, I pray those who are, who are far from you this morning, if there's people who are unbelievers this morning that are a part of our church, which every week there should be because we are being light in our world. God, I pray you speak to us as well. Help us just take one step closer to you. Amen. Hey, come on. Somebody, somebody say hi to someone next to you as you grab your seats and let's jump into God's word this morning. I know it's going to be great. Excited for it. Man, Easter's around the corner. Cannot wait. It's going to be amazing. How many of you guys remember the show, uh, the cartoon, not the movies, but the cartoon uh, uh, Transformers? You remember the theme song? The theme song was so catchy. Uh, Transformers more than meets the eye. Y'all know the other part where it says Transformers, robots in? See, y'all know, know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I used to love Transformers. Uh, my, my grandfather was a truck driver, so he drove an 18-wheeler. And I remember every time I would see his 18-wheeler, I used to think it was Optimus Prime. And I would, like, get all underneath it trying to find Optimus Prime's sword and, like, trying to see, like, is this really, like, do Transformers really live among us? You know, like, if there was a Chevy on a street, I'm, like, looking at my parents, like, what are you doing? I'm, like, they're, they're, trans, they're Transformers. You know, I, I, how many of you guys had, like, a, a wild imagination when you were a kid? You know, this idea when you're six, you think that that Camaro on the street is actually Bumblebee. That was me. I always thought maybe their Transformers are actually real. Um, kind of like, you know, Santa Claus or the Hulk or all the other kind of uh, things you do as a child. I think with Jesus, there's, there's always more than meets the eye. Uh, often Jesus will do things on the surface so that he can teach us something deeper. He's trying to teach us something than just what is on the surface uh, that we see. And uh, Today is week two in what we're titling kind of a, a series of, of messages, uh, Polarized. And we started it last week about talking about this idea that as uh, followers of Jesus, polarization is something that will naturally occur. 
And for many of us, we view polarization as this problem to solve. Like, how do we just, how do we try to get along with everybody? Um, but I'm here to tell you that, that if you follow Jesus correctly, you will always be polarizing. Like, like light cannot, cannot commingle with darkness. Life cannot commingle with death. Heaven cannot commingle with hell. And that does not mean that we now have a permission to be rude and ugly and mean to everybody. But when you come at it understanding this, that, that, that Christ will never get along with culture. Right? Like that, that's just not going to happen. And so the more that we lean into this idea that we are just going to be polarizing, can I encourage you with this idea, the more effective you will be as a believer, the more bright you will shine in dark spaces. Uh, uh, like Jesus does not say to put the light under a lampshade, but he says, shine bright. Shine bright like a diamond. Right? So, so right, like I want to be, I want to lean into that polarization. So anytime we see Jesus do something miraculous, it's never just for the miracle's sake. He's ultimately trying to teach us something. He's trying to teach us something about God. He's trying to teach something about Scripture. He's trying to show us something deeper. There's more than meets the eye with the miracle. And, and we see this message in John chapter 6 come after an incredible miracle where Jesus takes five loaves and two fishes and he feeds 20,000 people. Wow, what an incredible miracle. And if we only leave it there, we would only think that Jesus is just a greater Gordon Ramsay. But there's more than meets the eye. He's trying to teach us something about theology. Now, what is theology? Theology is the study of the nature of God. Who is God? What is God's character? What pleases God? What displeases God? Jesus is always trying to teach us good theology. Uh, great churches are built on good theology. Uh, great believers are built on great theology. And so when we see Jesus do a miracle, we have to ask, why is Jesus doing that miracle? And what is he trying to teach us about God? and the Trinity in Scripture. So when we see Jesus turn water into wine, um, we, could, we could be an immature believer and go, wow, what a really cool miracle. That's amazing. I want to invite Jesus to my parties. Uh, but, but what he's trying to do in a deeper level is to show us that, that Jesus is the greater wine, that when he spills his blood for humanity, that it would be able to be the best we've ever had. Jesus is trying to say, I'm the greater wine. I just don't do party tricks. When, when Jesus heals the blind... We can be amazed at the physical healing that is experienced there. But what Jesus is trying to show us through healing the, the physical blindness is that this, that I can also heal spiritual blindness. I can open the eyes of your heart to see that there's a spiritual realm to this life. You see, there's more than meets the eye with Jesus. When, when Jesus calms the storm, we, we don't look at Jesus and go, wow, what an amazing meteorologist. We go, man, Jesus can actually calm the storms in my life, and Jesus actually actually has the authority and power over storms at the, the sound of his voice. You see, Jesus is, is trying to do something deeper. When Jesus uh, raises Lazarus from the dead, we don't just go, wow, what an amazing thing. What a supernatural moment. We're, we should be asking, okay, what is Jesus trying to teach me about himself? And that is this, that Jesus, at the very sound of his voice, can conquer death. That's pretty amazing, right? Like, He's always trying to teach us something deeper. And if I had to summarize this, and this is a great thought for you in your Bible study, or to write this down, is that Jesus' miracles were not just theatrical, they're theological. They weren't just meant to impress us, they're meant to instruct us. So whenever you're reading scripture on your own and you see a miracle, don't just stop and go, wow, that's really amazing. Ask the question, God, what am I to learn from this? What, what through this miracle are you showing me? And, and when Jesus does the miracle of feeding 20,000 people with a Lunchable, he's not trying to just show us that he can feed people naturally. He's trying to show us something deeper. He's trying to show us that he's the ultimate source, that he is the one that we should all run to. He's trying to show the world on a deeper level that he should be their source. John 6, 35, it says this, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This statement is a polarizing statement. 
It's polarizing because Jesus does not say, hey, I am one of many options. Jesus says, I am the only option. So here's the deal, church. Like if we want our life to feel full, it's not just Jesus and all these other things. It's only Jesus. He's the only one that I can go to. He's the only one that will sustain me. He's the only one that will fill my life. He is the only one that will fulfill my soul. Jesus is being very polarizing in this statement. And in our culture today, we have this idea, well, there's many roads to the self-actualization. Uh, you live in a culture that says this, look deep within yourself. Look harder in your own self. I don't know about you, but when I look deeper into me, I just see more chaos. I just see more indecision. I just see more bad attitude. I just see more like, yeah, I'm trying, but I'm also like struggling. And like, I don't know who's supposed to help me, the messed up version of me or like the kind of getting it right version. Like there's just no such thing as self-help. Who's supposed to help me? Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. It's polarizing. Jesus goes even further. Again, I want you to see this. He just, does, he just did the miracle. Now he's teaching on it. He, he's saying this, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus is teaching us something else. He's saying this, not only am I the bread of life, but I'm also divine. And where I'm headed is to the cross. And, and the only way that you can eat of me is if I die. It sounds like Jesus is preaching cannibalism. Hold up, Jesus. I ain't about that life, you know what I'm saying? Like, I like red meat, but not too much, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what he's saying here again on a deeper level, let me go again. This is polarizing. Jesus is saying, not only will I solve the soul hunger problem, but I am from heaven. I am divine. I am the greater manna if we're going to build on the Old Testament. I'm the greater manna, I'm supernatural. Again, in our world... Uh, culture does not want to recognize Jesus as God. They want to recognize Jesus, one of the many great historical teachers and characters, just like a Gandhi would be, just like a Mother Teresa would be, just like a Buddha, just like a Muhammad, just like a Confucius. All these individuals who really weren't divine, but they were just really great teachers. The problem with this is this, that Jesus claims, I am the Son of Man. I am the Son of God. I am divine. So let me ask you, if you had a coworker walk in next, uh, next week and come to you and say, listen, I am divine. I am a God. Will you please worship me? How many of you guys are going to be like, all right, cool. What church you go to? I'm going to come chill with you. And how many of you guys would immediately just assume that everything else this person is saying is crazy? C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said this, you, you cannot just merely acknowledge Jesus as a great teacher. He is either a liar or he is telling the truth. There's no middle ground. And so when Jesus says, I come from heaven, he's polarizing. He's not trying to be in the middle. He's trying not trying to like find this compromise. He goes, no, I am divine. I am Lord. I am God. I am king. It's polarizing. We don't like it in culture. I love that Jesus is also really savage, too, because he feeds 20,000 people. And then he says this in verse 26. He says, he says, truly or truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You just want another free lunch. You don't want to actually follow me. Come on. Now, how many people do we do we do we have in our life that we follow Jesus because what he does for us, but we don't like when he tries to do things to us? We don't like when Jesus starts doing things in us. You ever seen somebody who struggles to connect with their emotional side? And then they start getting emotional, and it's massively uncomfortable for them? They're like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I don't know why I'm crying. I, don't, I hate this. Like, come on. How many of you guys, you struggle sometimes connecting with your emotional side? You're in a movie, and you're crying, and you're like, I don't know why I'm crying. I think a lot of people, uh, we like following Jesus for what he can do for us. Jesus, will you bless me? Will you provide for me? Will you feed me? Will you heal me? Oh, but Jesus, I don't want to submit to you. I don't want to look like you. I don't want to spread you. I don't want to follow you. But can you just keep doing things for me? Jesus is trying to show you, like, I'm trying to do something deeper. 
I don't want to just do something for you. I want to do something in you. I want to shape you. That's why the mission statement of Victory City is very clear. We want to help you take a step closer to Jesus because we understand this. When you take a step closer to Jesus, you'll look more and more like Jesus. And I just believe that our world needs more people that look like Jesus in their workplaces, in their schools, in their cities, come on, in their neighborhoods. Come on, can we commit to this idea? I may not be perfect, but I can take a step and I can take another step. I might not be at the finish line, but I'm still on the journey. I'm not quitting. I may have failed, but I can take another step after another step to look more and more like Jesus. Come on, somebody show your pedometer, whether it's on your phone or your Apple Watch or your Fitbit or wherever, and you're going, baby, I'm taking a step today. 10,000 steps. I'll get healthy. You see, we live in a culture who refuses to see Jesus as a supernatural source. We live in a culture that refuses to see Jesus as the supreme authority. And when believers make the claim that Jesus is my authority and Jesus is my source, you are naturally going to be polarizing. Like my source isn't my career. My source isn't my uh, my expressions, my source isn't my personality, my source isn't my reputation, my source isn't all these other things. My source is only in Jesus. And, and here's what I find in our world today, and maybe you can see this and you recognize this. I think in our world, people are always constantly filling themselves, but they never feel full. Never feel full. Like, how much is enough? Like, like how many sexual partners do I need until I feel loved? Like, how much money do I need to get till I feel rich? How, like, how many degrees do I need until I feel accomplished? Do you, you see what I mean? There's, there's this constant chasing and, and chasing down and more and more and more. I mean, how, how many conspiracies theories do you need to find out about on Facebook until you feel informed? Now I know what's really happening. Oh, you got the key? Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Come on, how many of you guys ever eaten Mexican food? Come on, that was a softball amen, right? Like, that was just like, how many of y'all eat Mexican food? Thank you. The, thing, the challenge I have with Mexican food is sometimes they give you the tor tortilla chips on the front end. And how many of you guys, you go through like three baskets of tortilla chips and queso and guacamole. And then you're so full that when like your fajitas come, you're like, man, I can't even touch this. So you take it to go. But the problem is, is all you ate was tortilla chips for lunch. And so two hours later, you're hungry again. Come on, anybody ever lived that life before, right? <laughs> we live in a society that fills themselves with nothing but tortilla chips. I set you up. We fill ourselves with information, accomplishments, tasks, social media, sexual partners. Like I think about how many, how many individuals right now are so addicted to pornography that this idea that, that somehow that if I can connect with this image on the other side of a screen, somehow I'll feel like masculine or somehow I'll feel connected or somehow like nobody ever looks at pornography and then finishes and feels, wow, I feel amazing about myself. It's always like, Bleh. I need to go take a shower. It's gross. Meaning, no matter how much I fill myself with the things of the world, I never feel full. And Jesus is saying this, fill your life with me. Now, here's where I think a lot of believers, now you would call yourself a Christian, and I know you're probably trying to do your best, but, but you need a pastor to come into your life and just help you with this. Um, we try to create unique spiritual cocktails. We take Jesus in activism. We take Jesus in careerism. We try to take Jesus and we try to, try to mix all these other things in, thereby diluting Jesus. Come on, have you ever had watered down Dr. Pepper? It's nasty. You know, like where the ice melts and it still looks brown, it still looks safe to drink, and then you take a drink and you're like, Bleh. No one ever takes a drink of watered down Dr. Pepper and thinks, this is so good. It's refreshing. Hits the spot. I mean, when we, when we dilute Jesus, what we actually do is we, we lose the effect of Jesus because Jesus does not want to share the space of your heart. 
Jesus is going, I'm not going to share your heart with your career. I'm not going to share your heart with you thinking uh, that it's all about your reputation. I'm not going to share uh, your heart with, with kind of the, the other people who are trying to share your heart and other relationships. Jesus is saying, uh, I don't share the throne. I don't share the throne. Come on, what kind of king would share the cr- throne? Like, have you ever shared a seat with somebody? It's the most uncomfortable thing. You ever fought over an armrest on a plane? I get there first, and I just stay there just like this, and I'm like, you ain't getting it. You ain't getting it. Come on, how many guys are sneaky fast? They, like, go to adjust their TV, and you're like, zip, sliding in. I hate the fight over the armrest. Jesus hates the fight over the armrest on the throne of your heart. Can you say Jesus is king? Jesus is the one, and Jesus is my source. Nobody else. Jesus, the armrest, the footrest, the ottoman, the pillow, the throw blanket, whatever you need. You little chilly Jesus, it's all yours. You have your rightful place on the throne of my heart. And guess what, church? That's going to be polarizing. Because the world's going to look at you and go, what? It's too extreme. In fact, it says here, John verse 6, verse 60 says this. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? What, what his disciples were saying is, Jesus, this is too extreme. This is too polarizing, Jesus. The disciples didn't need Facebook, Instagram, CNN, and Fox News to call something polarizing. The disciples thought, man, this is, this is too much. This is too far. Jesus continues on and he says this. Is, it, is in, it is the spirit who gives life and the flesh is no help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. I want to leave you with this. I want to kind of help you with this idea. I got three thoughts for you this morning. The first one is this, is that Jesus is my soul source. Now you can have some play on words and have some fun with it. I spelled it S-O-L-E, like meaning Singular. But if you want to change it up and call it soul, like soul, like S-O-U-L or soul of your feet. I don't know. It may, I'm just use it however you want to. But Jesus is my singular soul source in life. It is the spirit who gives life. What Jesus is saying is this. Is it's not about the golden corral of culture. Come on. Golden corral, you just feel nasty after you leave. Like, anybody ever go to Golden Crown and think, this is a great idea, and then immediately you leave and you're like, I hate my life. <laughs> I just had shrimp fried rice next to Jello. What is my problem? I'm just, it's nasty. Chicken fried steak with enchiladas. What's wrong with my life? And that's the problem. We try to buffet our spiritual life. We try to, like, mix Oprah and Jesus. We get on TikTok and we think all these TikTok theologians are giving us great ideas. We, we get on Google and we try to Google our way to Jesus. Meaning we try to go through this golden corral of culture when Jesus is going, no, 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 I'm your only source. You see, and I think for a lot of believers, um, the challenge becomes um, when Jesus begins to improve, improve your life. Like, I get it. Uh, there's a lot of people who, who came to Jesus on a Hail Mary. Like, everything else in my life was terrible, so I gave Jesus a shot, and Jesus picked me up out of the ashes. Like, I mean, like, and I'm thankful that Jesus can do that. But what happens is, is because you begin to follow Jesus when you were desperate, then when you're no longer desperate because he improves your life, you don't uh, lean on Jesus like you used to. Come on, how many of you guys, you prayed for the miracle of the five loaves and two fishes when you were broke because you had five dollars and two quarters and you were like, Jesus, can you multiply it? Jesus, can you make it happen? I'm tired of ramen noodles. I'm tired of peanut butter and jelly. And, and And then Jesus improves your life and you don't pray like you used to pray anymore. Come on, cause you, cause you had that, that new paycheck feel. You know what I'm saying? Like, like when you get a raise and your paycheck looks different and you start feeling like all amazing. You know what I'm saying? Like tax return. Like the tax return comes in and you're like, oh, yeah. Come on. You remember COVID relief? Like you got that COVID and it was supposed to be for essential items and you were like, new TV. You know? <laughs> meaning, meaning we enjoy the blessings of God, but I wonder how many of us the blessings of God actually break us because we were using God not following God. So like, well, like when your mom was sick 
and you were praying for a miracle, you prayed every hour of every day and you called out on Jesus' name because you were believing for the miracle and whether he healed her or he didn't when that season passed for, from, from, from your life, you didn't pray like you used to because life was good. And a lot of believers, when life gets good, they stop leaning on Jesus as their sole source. They think, well, yeah, Jesus, but I'm also actually kind of intelligent and I can get things done. Well, yeah, Jesus, but now I'm making 100K a year and so, like, I'm all right. Yeah, well, Jesus, well, yeah, now I'm good and now I'm married because God brought somebody in my life. Yeah, yeah, Jesus, and I'm good because now we've adopted or now we've had kids and, and now God's given me what I was believing for. And how many of us, we stop leaning on Jesus to the same degree because Jesus has blessed us? And I find what happens is this, is that a lot of believers move off this idea and polarization of, I don't care about the blessings, I'm going to the blesser. I don't care about the healing, I'm going to the healer. I don't care about the provision, I'm going to the provider. I don't care about the storm, I'm going to the storm stopper, right? Like I'm going to the source. I'm going to him, and that's what Jesus is saying. Don't follow me because your belly is full. Follow me because I'll fill your heart. I'll fill your soul. I love, I love what the original uh, Latin-speaking Christians, they had a saying in, in early Orthodox Christianity that was this, solus Christus, only Jesus. So y'all want to say it with me this morning? Say solus Christus, only Jesus. You see, if your source is only Jesus, then you know who to go to when storms Hit. You know who to run to when you're feeling empty. And this is why spiritual disciplines are so powerful. You see, prayer reminds me every single day of, that my life is dependent on God. I'm not praying just in emergency. I'm praying in consistency. You see, serving reminds me of this because it reminds me of the greater purpose I'm a part of that the world does not just revolve around me. You see, church attendance reminds me of this because I'm re remaining dependent on God. I love what Dr. Tony Evans says, who's a pastor in Oak Cliff, Texas. He says this, there's a lot of people who say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And Dr. Tony Evans would say this, you are right, but you don't have to go home to be married. But if you stay away from home long enough, it'll affect the relationship. Come on, God's blessed your life long enough. Don't stay away from home. Come to his house and lean upon him because solus Christus, he is my source. Jesus is teaching us something deeper, which is going to be polarizing. So rather than Sunday fun day and mimosas with brunch, what if we came to the Lord and we came to Christ and we said, God, I'm, I'm joining with God's people and I'm going to be there because you are my only source. You see, in chapter 4, Jesus is still teaching on the same type of theme. He's, he's talking about bread, and he's talking about the bread of life, except it's in a different context. And we're going to go there for just a second. In John chapter 4, they're going to put it on the screen. It says this, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say that yet there are four months, then comes harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. It's almost like Jesus is looking at a Texas cotton field when, when it's ripe for harvest. What Jesus is doing in this moment, he's actually looking at a city, and people are coming out of that city to meet him. And he tells his disciples, hey, my food is doing the will of the Father. And you see all those people out there, when you reach them for me, it'll fill your life. My second thought for you this morning is this, that Jesus is my shareable source. I mean, you ever go to the restaurant and somebody puts down bread? What's the etiquette when there's four people and there's five rolls? <laughs> and nobody gets one. Like how many, you get, you're the person, you're like, I don't even care. I'm getting it. If I'm paying for it, I'm getting that roll. And some of you are like non-confrontation. You're like, well, I don't want to be, you know, even if somebody offers it to me, I'm going to be like, no, no, thank you. But I, I love bread. I really do love bread. I, mean, I, got, I got a challah bread, got a wheat grain bread, got a ciabatta, got a bagel, got a French loaf. How many of you guys love French loaves? I don't even know the difference. It just all tastes good. I like sourdough. I like making BLTs really good. Come on, I got tortillas. Anybody? But, uh, but I think bread's meant to be shared. You know what I'm talking about? Val, can I share some bread with you? It's okay. Come on, come on up. Come on up. Get some I know you're taking notes. I love it. And you got your coffee. 
Come on, there we go. I'm gonna share some. That's good. Kenan, I'm gonna share some bread with you, okay? Can I share bread with you? I'm breaking bread with Kenan. There we go. You can share it around too. Your wife's pregnant, she needs bread. Come on. Uh, Drew, Drew's got, can I share some bread with you? No, okay. Jamie, come on up here. Jamie's a personal trainer, and so he's probably not gonna eat this bread, but will you share it? Can you share it? There we go. Pass it around. Come on. How do you guys know that, that bread is meant to be broken and shared? Shared. Can, can I share something? I, I, tell me your name, sir. Mel? M-O-E. Uh, can I share some bread with you? There we go. Okay. You, you don't have to eat it, but I just wanted to share it with you. Um, but but I, love, I love warm, fresh bread. You know, for believers, there's a deeper level of fulfillment that happens when we share, when we share the bread that we've enjoyed. And what a lot of believers do is they want to keep the bread of life all for themselves. And they want to just gorge themselves on the bread of life rather than going out into the world to share it. And here's what I find in culture is this, is that one of the things you'll hear in culture is, is stop pushing Jesus. Like, they'll say this, they'll say this, why are you always pushing your beliefs on other people? Has anybody ever heard that? Like, stop pushing your beliefs on other people. Isn't it funny that they're doing the exact same thing that they want you to stop? Like, have you ever thought about it? Okay, you want me to stop pushing Jesus, but you're pushing an idea that I shouldn't push Jesus. What makes you the authority? Because you're offended? Because you just don't like it? And all these Christians all over the world, they go, okay, I'm so sorry, I won't share Jesus anymore. Like, why are you always talking about Jesus in the workplace? You need to stop that. Why? What makes you the authority? Why should I compromise with you? And that's what I'm saying. Believers, let's get a little polarizing. Because every time you compromise with culture, it's always a one-sided compromise. I mean, has culture ever said, all right, guys, listen, I know we've been really harsh on you not sharing Jesus. For the next three months, you can share Jesus. Has culture ever done that? That's why the enemy is a devourer. He wants to take more and more and more and more and more from you. And so many believers, because we want to live in this compromise of unity with the world and this cultural cocktail, we capitulate to culture and we go, okay, my bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. I think, no, 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 I've got the bread of life and he's the greatest thing in my life and I'm going to share him whether you take it or not. You may not eat it, but I'm going to share it. You may be keto spiritually, but I'm going to share the bread, right? Like I'm going to do every single thing I can to share bread. And, and here's the thing. Can I give you a little inside information about Victory City Church? Can I do that really quick? Um, and here's what I want to help understand. This is kind of a leadership thought. The number one reason why people come to our church is because they see us from the highway, which is amazing. But it's also an indictment. Like, like, I want our church to grow not because people commute by us. I want our church to grow because our church has a conviction in their heart that they will reach lost people for the kingdom, that they will share bread, that they will go to their neighborhoods, that they will go to their workplaces, and they will not just invite, but they will bring. Come on. Y'all remember in college when you would go to the party? You would not say, hey, I'm inviting you to come to this. You would say, hey, I'm picking you up at 9 o'clock. And we're going to show up. We're going to go together. And some of you, you try to like softball it lighthearted and do this whole like passive, well, I'll invite you. No. Say, what is your Starbucks order? I will pick you up. We are going to the 1045 and you are sitting next to me. Why? Because I'm sharing bread. A few weeks ago, we did a women's night, and uh, yeah, thank you. Where's my ladies at? It was great. We almost had 200 women come up and worship the Lord, and it was incredible. And there was a young lady in our church. Her name is Jordan. She serves on the Dream Team, and um, yeah, Woo. Um, and uh, Jordan, Jordan had a best friend uh, that she was praying and believing would come to Jesus, and. Um, over and over again, was inviting her, was doing her best to bring her. And, and finally, um, finally, on women's night, she said, hey, come, we're doing a women's thing. Um, I'd love for you to come. And, and uh, that night, Pastor Stacy Hennigan, who you heard a few weeks ago, she preached that the women's night did an incredible job. 
And uh, I actually snuck in for a little bit of women's night. I had to leave when the preaching started because I looked out of place. Um, and uh, Jordan posted on her social media that the best friend that she had been inviting actually surrendered her life and named Jesus the King. And so there's a picture of Jordan and her best friend. Hey, come on, let's do better than that. That's incredible, church. And she was, she was so incredibly proud of this moment because it was a moment where she was taking the bread of life that she knew she had and she began to share it. Can I tell you, there will be a fulfillment and a filling purpose in your life when you have friends and family and random people at Target. I don't care who you're reaching. They're with you and you take the picture with them after they've surrendered their life to Jesus. Can I tell you, it will fill your soul like none other and I want it for you. I, I, I want it for every single person in my church to feel that joy of knowing that you have participated in someone stepping into eternity. See, we should share our bread. In fact, at the end of the service, you're getting invite cards. And so this, that is bread. Share it. Share it. My third thought for you this morning as we close is this, is that Jesus is my eternal source. So if, if Jesus is my soul source and Jesus is my shareable source, then Jesus is also my eternal source. We're getting down to the moment with his disciples where it gets real. Yeah, we're getting to the practical, applicable moment. How many of you guys know you can hear a thousand messages but it's different when you begin to try to just apply one of them. Like it's not, it's not the absorbing of the message that makes it real. It's the application. Like when I actually begin to put it into practice. Like I dare you this week, just try to apply sharing Jesus with somebody else. Y'all be so nervous. Your palms be sweaty. Spaghetti on your mom's T-shirt. Is that right? Yeah, I said it wrong. Will the real Slim Shady please stand up? <laughs> Meaning like when I actually put it into practice is when it gets real. And so now Jesus is with the disciples. John 6, 66 says this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Can I just say as a pastor, this gives me relief that even Jesus had people leave his church. But what Jesus did is Jesus actually didn't chase them. And say, hey, all right, my bad, Maybe that was too harsh. Come back, I'll lower the bar. So what if at Victory City Church we never chose to lower the bar and there were people that came to our church that just didn't want to rise to the standard of Jesus? So like what if we just had the belief that I just believe scripturally that every person should be generous with their finances? And if you're like, I don't want to do that, that's fine, but here's our expectation. I'm not lowering the bar. What if we just believe in the scriptural, uh, scriptural sexual ethic of the Bible? And we said, no, we're not, we're not going to lower that to cultural standards. And people leave us because we're not their ally. But we actually want something greater for them, and so we don't lower the, scripture, the, the bar. We don't lower that. And not in hate and not in, like, anger, like in love, but we're, we're not going to lower the bar. What if we just believe that every person who's a part of the church should serve the church? And should be a participator, not just a spectator. Like, like, what if we didn't lower that bar? What if we just believe this, that every single year, every person who calls Victory City Church their home should be doing something to evangelize for Jesus? That's too hard. That's too extreme. This is a hard saying, Pastor Eric. I know it is, but there's a grace that will help you. Because what we do affects eternity, not just the immediate. You know, I really do, honestly, like, I go to H-E-B, and I really do buy bread like this whenever I go grocery shopping. Because I like BLTs. I like um, French toast. Like, I like a good turkey sandwich. And I don't like Mrs. Baird's. I like this. Like, I want this right here. And I cut it, and it's all odd and misshapen. But I like, I like this right here. I like fresh bread. Really, I do. But the problem with this is how many of you guys know that like when it's fresh, it's great. 
But, but isn't it so annoying that like three days later, there's like a green spot and you only use like half of it? Now, I grew up real poor, y'all. So in my house, we just cut it off. Like, <laughs> we just cut that mess off. <laughs> Right, like mom was like, we used all the grocery money, honey. So like if you want a sandwich, cut it off. Now some of y'all are immediately grossed out. My wife did not grow up that way. If it even had a whisper of a spot, she was like, trash. Like, no, that's still good. Come on, you put some water on that, put it in the microwave, it gets real soft. Come on, I had to stretch it. You know, there's things that you're chasing in your life that aren't Jesus that maybe for the first three days, three months, three years is real good. But then it starts getting moldy. And, and maybe like when you were in your 20s and 30s, it was party culture. Like you go down to Rainy Street, turn up a little bit. But it starts getting moldy because you're going, it's not enough. Maybe you're in a situation right now where you're having an affair on your spouse and it's fresh and it's fun, but you keep doing that, it'll start getting moldy. Right now, maybe you've got unforgiveness in your heart because you will not obey scripture and forgive a person. And right now it feels fresh and it feels right. And you feel self-righteous, and, and but Jesus is telling you to forgive them and you're going, no, 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 this bread feels fresh. But how many of you guys know you keep holding on to that unforgiveness, it turns into bitterness, and it actually turns your whole life moldy? And I wonder how many of us were chasing after moldy bread, and we're chasing down cultural cul-de-sacs because we're trying to play the middle between Jesus and culture, thinking we can have the best of both worlds. But can I tell you, in Jesus, we have a bread that is always fresh and always satisfying and will never mold and will never decay. And we can always come to him because it's in him who is our source. Let me pray with you. Will you stand with me as we close? I want to pray for two people this morning. I want to pray for people who would say that they are believers, but maybe they're playing in the middle ground and, and they, they need to begin to go, Jesus, what do I need to eliminate from my life that is not you? And I lean on you. Maybe I need to pray for people to begin to share the bread of life with those around them. I want to pray for believers, and I want to pray for unbelievers. Dear Jesus, I pray over every person who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. God, I pray you give them the strength to live solus Christus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus, he is my source. God, I pray you give them the courage and the boldness to share the bread of life with those who are hungry around them. God, I pray in Jesus' name, there are individuals right now, God, they're chasing all kinds of different things, and God, through your Holy Spirit, you're speaking to them right now about the things that they need to eliminate from their life so that they can prioritize you. God, I pray you speak to them. And God, I pray you give them the supernatural wisdom and ability to begin to eliminate that so they can lean on Jesus. For the unbelievers, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, but I want to invite you to step into relationship with Jesus. You see, if you're here this morning, and if there is any doubt in your heart or mind on whether you are following Jesus, this is for you. And I want to invite you to step into relationship with Jesus through a prayer of salvation by surrendering your life to him. You see, when we come to Jesus, we don't accept Jesus. Jesus accepts us. We surrender our life to him. We name him king. We don't name Jesus our buddy. We name him our Lord. And if that's you this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, whether you've walked away from Jesus or maybe this is the first time, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three as, a, as an outward sign of an inward decision. Because it's not about the flesh, it's about the spirit, but it's a sign of saying, Jesus, that's me. And I want to lead you in a prayer. If that's you, on the count of three, just lift your hand up high so I can see you. It's nobody looking around, just me, you, and the Holy Spirit. If that's you, on the count of three, just lift your hand. One, two, three, wherever you're at, just lift your hand, just like this. Praise God. Praise God. I think in the back, I'm going to trust that there's hands going up. I can't see all the way back there, but you know who you are. If you've raised your hand, yep, I see you. Praise God. Let me lead you in a simple prayer. 
and just say this. Say, Jesus, today I surrender my life to you. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins and help me follow you. I name you Lord, King, and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, church. Can we celebrate every single person? Come on, let's do better than that. Every single person.